right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time ever joining us, well, first of all, welcome, and you chose a really good day uh, to do so. So Exploring by Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. Head over to exploringbytheseat.com, and you can find dozens and dozens of events uh, for your classroom to join in live. All right, we are heading out into the field. We are taking a virtual field trip to Osa Conservation's biological station in Costa Rica. It is a bubble of conservation and tropical science innovation. We're gonna be joined by National Geographic Explorer, uh, Dr. Andrew Whitworth, and he will show us real life, uh, what it's like in a remote research station. And we'll get to meet uh, some of the crew and see some of the amazing projects that they are working on. So I'm going to bring Andy in with us live from the forest. Andy, how are you doing today? Hey, Joe. How are you doing? Good, good. Always a pleasure to see you. I'm loving the background sounds of uh, being immersed <laughs> in the Costa Rican rainforest. Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, and the sun's shining, which is nice because we're uh, we're kind of starting our deep wet season. So we got lucky with the weather and uh, the birds are singing and the forest is alive. All right. I love it. Well, Andy, I am going to let you be our guide. Let's dive in. Let's explore uh, the research station. Absolutely. So I wanted to start this morning out in the forest because that's, you know, the reason why I'm out here, right? Because of this incredible rainforest. But what I really want to share today is a little taste of what it's like to live and work and be in a biological field station. So this is where researchers and conservationists and people from all around the world hang out who love nature and are inquisitive and we want to we want to find out about these amazing tropical ecosystems and i felt i spent 12 years now living and working in these stations and it's really shaped my career and, and what i'm what i'm doing and and who i've met along the way on the journey and so i want to give you a kind of virtual experience of of what it's like so we're going to meet some really cool people from all around the world doing different research projects, different conservation projects. We're going to start in the kind of chill out area. So most research stations have a nice kind of dining area. We've got our, our cooks in the back there. And this is all the food. I wanted to start today just by showing you all the food that we grow at our, our local farm. So we try and produce as much food as we can for the field station. And it's amazing. You can see we've got pineapples, guanabanas, this crazy thing here called achiote, which is like a red food coloring, very natural. We've got turmeric, lots of different types of gingers, bananas and plantains. We got some little coconuts down here on the floor, the peepers, and lots of papaya. Papaya is a really great fruit. It's medicinal, so we love papaya. And then this is organic rice. We just harvested this last week. We've got like an eight month supply of organic uh, rice that we grew on the farm. And the reason I wanted to show you the food is because if we want to think about conservation, we want to think about how we live, food is a big part of that. And so that's why we have an organic farm and we have people trying to look at ways that we can do biodiversity friendly food production and thinking about ways that we can make food production beneficial for people and nature. And uh, so, I'm going to head out into the station. So I'm just going to show you behind me. So we have this trail that wanders off to the classroom. We've got a laboratory that we're going to go and explore. And then some of the cabins. And look, we're now, uh, we're now COVID friendly. Lots of hand washing stations. <laughs> so I'm going to take you out through the station. And the sun is really beating down today. It's really hot. It's like 34 degrees. And what's unique about these tropical systems is the humidity. So it's about 95% humidity right now. So you're constantly sweating in these biological field stations. Um, and it's just really quite intense, but a brilliant place. And look, we're absolutely surrounded by rainforest. Rainforest full of spider monkeys and jaguars and pumas. I woke up the other day and I had an ocelot just walking past my bedroom window um, as uh, I was I was getting up and uh, lying in bed. So I've come now to our little classroom. This is where we do a lot of the workshops and we, we train students and do presentations in here. 
and you can see really cool piece of artwork that somebody made, one of our visitors made. This is plastic from the ocean, from the beach, and he turned it into this fabulous mosaic of a sea turtle. And that leads me, segues me into, uh, I believe you know this guy, uh, Joe, Fabian, our sea turtle coordinator. Hey, Fabian. Hello. How are you, everyone? Sure do. Hey, Fabian. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. I'm actually very happy to share what happened this morning during our work. So talk us through it. What, what happened this morning? So first of all, we woke up very, very early to walk up and down the beach looking for sea turtle activity. And we got three new nests, like turtles, three turtles last night. They came and laid three nests. And also we released 200 babies. So after that, we came here. And now we are writing all that information down because that's very important for us to understand what is happening on the beach, how many babies we have and how many new turtles come to lay their eggs. Cool. And, and what species of sea turtle were they? Uh, they were olive bridleys. Uh, the olive bridley is one of the smallest sea turtle in the world and is one of the most common turtles that we have in the Asa Peninsula. And how big do they get? Is, there, is this an olive ridley here? No, this is actually a green turtle nest, a green turtle skull. Uh, Olive Ridley is a little bit smaller. Okay. Just a little. Cool. So now you put the data in, and then what happens with this information? What, what do you do with that data that you're collecting? Oh, we store it in a database to have a better perspective of the nesting activities. And we analyze everything. We analyze trends, like how many turtles we have every year, if that is increasing or reducing, and how we can help the turtle community, the turtle population to grow and protect them. Fantastic. Cool. And then what's yeah. happening over here? Yeah, here, one of the research field assistants is working with the baskets. These baskets, these things, we place them on top of the nest that we have in the hatchery. And these things will protect them from fleas, from crabs, birds. And also when the babies hatch, all, uh, all the babies will be contained inside of this structure. So that will allow us to see the babies, count them, measure them, and bring them to the beach to release them. Cool. So how many days off a week do you take, Fabian? <laughs> I don't know what uh, day off. <laughs> No, I, we try to have one day off of the week, but this work is kind of like living on a day off because it's a paradise. <laughs> okay, I must just go Andy, on, Joe. Jump in for a sec. We've got a question coming yeah. in via YouTube uh, wondering Do you ever take the eggs to incubate them, or do you always kind of protect them and then do your count after they've hatched? Okay, so Fabian, you um, say that. We have many ways of protecting the nest. One is that we uh, we build a place on the beach. The, we place that we build a hatchery where we incubate all the nests. We also protect them on the beach naturally. We just put some structures around those nests so they hatch uh, in natural conditions. And some of the nests we also try to incubate them on cooler boxes, like uh, another kind of method to uh, protect and incubate the turtle eggs. Yeah. So we have different methods actually to incubate those those nests. Cool. Okay, Joe, any more questions for Fabian whilst we're, whilst we're with Fabian? We can always come back later or, or can I keep moving along? Yeah, let's keep moving along, but Fabian and team, great job. Great to hear those stories. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to pop into the uh, to the little office here where, where we've got the Marine Dream Team. Um, hopefully you can see them. So we've got, Joe, you know Noelia, Noelia Hernandez. Dr. Noelia is a National Geographic Explorer. And then Hi. Mary Laura is uh, our working away with uh, some underwater technology that these guys are going to tell us about. So tell us a little bit about what you guys do in the marine program. Uh, on a higher one, uh, the first of all, um, the Osa Peninsula is known for to be one of the most amazing place, the rainforest. 
but the people doesn't know that it's amazing the, the oceans also has not been explored so much and we try to to discover more about what they are in the ocean and to protect um, with coral restoration and well, restoration projects and also to create a marine protected area uh -huh. the last year we had the opportunity to speak with joe during the expedition with the pristine seas um, that was amazing. Here we have some photos. The last year we couldn't show to you some videos and photos, but now yes. And I have here some well, five photos for show to the people. Do you remember that, Joe, when we were on the Pristine Seas expedition out on the on the boat? How could I forget? That was a, an awesome <laughs> event. I can share that uh, that link as well with the teachers that they want to see a little bit. Yeah, so there's been a lot of follow-up work being done and we've produced these, uh, well, Noelia and the Pristine Seas team have produced this amazing document of scientific evidence um, from the expedition and they're working really hard now to make sure that there's a, a protected area created for the region. So, Mary Laura, why don't you show us what you're doing? It looks like you're playing, well, to me, it looks like you're playing about with a, a PlayStation <laughs> or an Xbox. You might look like it, but what we have here is a submarine drone. You might have seen drones before. Normally, you imagine them in the air, but we also have drones that dive. This is an amazing tool that we're using right now to monitor and explore some ecosystems in the Gulf of Dulce, mainly seagrass meadows, uh, coral reefs, and um, yeah, this is the controller. This works as our like Wi-Fi spot. So we just connect it to the drone and this connects this to our magnificent controller. And we can like kind of watch live what submarine life that drone is looking at. What's happening and how does the drone move? Like how do you how do you get it to move around underwater? What 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 works on the drone? Okay, so well, we have all these propels and... Ah, so these are the propellers. Yeah. Okay. And then it's pretty much like playing a video game. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, it's really, really the same. So there you go, uh, Joe. Being a modern day technological biologist is basically playing video games. Oh. All right. <laughs> so those keep playing those games if you want to be like a drone pilot or something. Very cool. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm going to keep moving because we've got a lot of people to see. But um, if there's people that have got questions about drones and the marine ecosystem, we're going to we can go back and do questions there later. But I'm going to keep flying around on this tour of the biological station. So I'm going to go over now. Um, we're going to meet. Look at this. So we're completely off the grid, Joe. There's no electricity here. So we have to use solar panels. We run the station completely on um, solar energy and we have a little hydroelectric bit of energy as well. And I'm going to introduce you to our team here who work with mangrove restoration. So hopefully I'm going to get myself in position. Um, we've got Marco who works with the communities, Roberto who also works on the mangrove restoration. And then Javier is leading up the mangrove restoration project. So he's going to tell us a little bit about what he's got on the table in front of us here and tell us a bit about what are mangroves and why do we need to restore mangroves? Hi everyone, I'm Javier, as Andy said. Um, mangroves are amazing. Uh, they are almost in every coastal, uh, one coastal around the world. Uh, they are adapted to, to live there. They have different adaptations to, uh, to tolerate high salinity conditions, also high uh, low, uh, oxygen conditions uh, uh, they so give... so what are these T tell me show me some of the stuff that you've got on the table so are all of these things on the table these are all mangroves or, or is one of these a mangrove this all, all these are seeds of mangroves one of them uh, are looks like candles uh, they have this this precision maybe if you can show them how uh, okay. is, uh, let, the, let me... the, the seeds fold and, and and get into the they just stick into the mud. In, in, yeah, in the, into the muck, and that's how they uh, start growing. They, when they fall, they are a tree uh, before they get to the ground. Uh, that's an adaptation that only the mangroves ha have. But what about this thing? Because this, I mean, this is. Well, I mean, look at the difference in those seeds. Let me. This is one of the mangroves, completely different to that skinny little seed. This 
this that you can see here, it's going to be the root of the of the mangroves. As you can see, it's almost like a heart. Mm -hmm. The shape is like a heart, and this gets to the into the ground like this, and this is the root, and then it opens and it starts growing. And look at here. This is when when this open looks like this. These are the cotyledons that help the mangroves to to grow. This give like the food to to the this baby plant, and then it start growing. Okay. And what about this thing? I mean, this is enormous. Check out the size of that thing. I can only just fit it in my hand. What what is this? This big uh, seed. It's another species. It's, it is a uh, mora oleifera. Okay. It's it's another a uh, mangrove. Uh, a plant that well, what is this there. thing this is a seed this is the, or, or it's yes a, this it is looks the like seed. a bean yeah it, it looks like a bean yeah but a big bean a big bean <laughs> yeah it opens also like this uh-huh and the the plants start growing wow i think can you eat these it yeah no <laughs> <laughs> have you tried no <laughs> yeah maybe you can try and see <laughs> we might be able to save world hunger if we uh, if these beans are edible um, okay, so what, what else? You've got a drone on the table. What's yeah. the drone about? This drone is what we use to monitor the areas. We have been restoring the, the mangrove because many hectares have been deforested and we have to, to walk around many hectares to, to check where do, can we do the, the restoration or maybe we can uh, monitor those sites. So the new techno technologies help us to, this, to do this in a quicker to, to do it faster. So you can just fly over the area and then gather imagery like photos yeah. and the, videos. The, the drones start like taking photos, many, uh -huh. many, many photos. And then we join all of them and we can see like the whole area and then start like uh, planning uh, the planting or see how the trees are, are growing, the, cock, the, the shade they okay. are generating. So you can do it for two things. You can design your restoration yes. experiments using the drone quickly, and then you can monitor things afterwards as the mangroves. That's what we stuff. do with, with the drone. And it's easier for us because if we don't have this technology, we have mm -hmm. to walk and to take all that information. <laughs> and now we can do it quicker with, with this technology. Okay. So you can do much bigger areas. Yeah. Okay. And what's the hardest thing about restoring mangroves? Is it the same as like, you know, restoring a rainforest or? No, it, it is very different because uh, in the mangroves, we have uh, many titles uh, that came into the mangrove. Uh, it is, uh, many people say that uh, mangrove trees are like amphibians because they have to be like half of the time uh, the roots are underwater and half of the time they are dry. So mm -hmm. that's a, a big deal we have to, to, to manage when we are restoring um, mangroves. Uh, and also the big sun is, is always... Ahead of us, yes. Uh, it's hard to, to walk there. What uh, about animals? Are there any animals that you have to be careful with? Yes. Oh, uh, the boas. Boas. Bo boas. Boas <laughs> predator. <laughs> big boas. Uh, the last time I, I was in, in the mangrove, I found a big boa. Uh -huh. uh, and it was wow. amazing. Good colors. Uh, I'd, I'd like that. Also, some caimans. Caimans. Uh, ca what about crocodiles? Cro crocodiles, yeah. They yeah. were also in the mangroves, but, but they don't mess with us. <laughs> Andy, I want to jump in a question here. I've got a question yeah. here from Thunder, Ontario in Canada. And they're wondering, why are the seeds so big? What benefit does that give them? Yeah, so why are these seeds so big, say, compared to some of the smaller ones we see from other trees? If, even when, when we don't, if it, it is a big oh. size, but these seeds go floating into the water. And it gives the, the, the species also also this one and, and this one, they are always floating in the water and they have different adaptations. This one uh, start like uh, getting full of, of water and then it falls down. And when the tide, the, the tidals uh, fall, uh, ends, uh, the seat is like in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is also like that to, to float. So in, this in the thing water. floats? Yeah. Wow. Okay. They can so travel many, many. So we don't know like completely with the size, but uh, but certainly they're all adapted to the to the system, right? They've mm -hmm. and and what about like so so is that do we see are there different species of mangroves all around the world, or is it like are, are these mangroves are these the same mangroves that we see say in India on the other side? No, of the we world? have different uh, species of mangroves in Costa Rica. We have eight or seven, some people say seven, some people say eight, but that's the, the number we have here in, in Costa Rica. 
uh, we work with four species, uh, mangle rojo, uh, that is a uh, risophora mangle, uh, uh, mangle piñuela, that's the common name, the, uh, this is Pelicera risophorae, mangle salado, avicenia, and you can't stop you can't stop scientists spitting yeah. out latin names joe <laughs> they're always going to do it yeah <laughs> sorry for that <laughs> all right cool well thank you very much for telling us about the mangroves um we're going to come on and if people have got questions about the mangroves um keep noting them down and we'll come back to javier and his team all see right you. thanks guys right now i'm going to take you to our wonderful lab you can see this beautiful mural that we painted this year um to jazz things up a little bit and I'm going to take you inside the laboratory building so this is our new lab building I think you've been in here before Joe and we've got a bunch of people working away at the workbench hey say hey everyone <laughs> hey everyone Joe you know Eleanor I believe you've met this lady before hi Joe hey, Eleanor. yeah and we're, we're kind of hanging out with all these dead things these ske these skeleton eleanor's friends um so this guy here this is a, a puma right well tell, tell us about this puma so you can see his really big deep ear and this is one of the five cat species that we have here in the also so it's the second biggest after the jaguar but still pretty big as you can see the size of these teeth compared to my head <laughs> and what happened to this puma how did you get hold of this um so this puma was actually found in one of the local eco lodges by one of the local nature guides and it was found stuck in a tree um we think it was a juvenile trying to hunt up in the trees maybe chasing some monkeys and it fell and got its head stuck um in two branches so they donated the skeleton to us and we had a family of volunteers put it together and you can see it's big claws here as well okay it's really scary. and what other stuff tell us a little bit more about what you do and what you've got there so this is also a puma footprint you can see it's kind of the same size as my hand um but i don't necessarily want to give them a high five but how we make these footprints is if we find them um, in the rainforest, sometimes when it's really muddy on the ground, you can see their footprints. So we can say, ah, there has been a puma here. And then we can then mold it. So we put something like cling film on the ground and then pour this mold, wait an hour and it dries. And then we've got this really cool hard footprint of a puma. Okay. Um, what Someone else? Someone else I have here. Now, I think this is one of my favorite animals. So this guy lives up in the trees. You might often see them hanging like this um, and they move really, really slowly. So this is a sloth. Um, they spend most of their time up in the trees. They perhaps come down kind of like once a week. Um, and you'll often see, because they move so slowly, you'll see that they've got algae growing on their fur and it makes them kind of a shade of green so they blend up in the, in the forest canopy. And so when you find these things, these skeletons, like, you just find them lying in the forest, are they like covered in fur and do you find the whole animal or is it pretty much you just find the bones, right? Yeah, we pretty much just find the bones. Sometimes it can kind of be in a few areas across the forest floor. But often what happens is there's lots of ants that are coming in and clean all the bones. So they kind of feed on the, on the fur and the flesh and leave us with these beautiful skeletons. So we can show you guys. So literally almost nothing goes to waste in a rainforest, no. especially with you around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's right. a circle of life. And what about, what's, what's this stuff over here? Yeah. Show me some of this. So this is what we use to monitor living wildlife. So this is a really cool tool. It's a camera trap. So we can put these in the rainforest because obviously it's very difficult for me to sit in the rainforest and try and find jaguars because they're so elusive. So we install one of these and it has a sensor and some infrared so it can detect um, species that move at night time. Um, and then it has this lens here. So when an animal walks past in front of the camera, it triggers the camera and it takes a video so we can see what wildlife is where um, and then figure out what we can do to conserve it to increase populations in some areas or increase more activity in some areas. So these are really useful for a wildlife biologist. Cool. Um, show me that thing, that, that yellow thing at the end this. of the bench. Yeah, what's that? This 
is a mandible of a toucan. So we get the yellow-throated toucan here. And you can see this beautiful long beak. And they use these to feed on and crunch on lots of big seeds. It's super light. I was quite shocked when I picked this thing up. Like, it's really, I don't know, you, you expect with a toucan that it's going to be really heavy, but it's really light and extremely strong. And it's got these really sharp ridges uh, at the end. There. It's very cool. Nice. All right. We're going to keep moving along. So we'll be thinking of some great questions about animals. And then we're going to say hello to Maria Jose, who's doing some weird stuff with mud. Always. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Jose, and this is Johan. And we are part of the restoration and rewilding team. And so we have planted uh, many thousands of trees among the Osa Peninsula and also into the Amistosa region now. And a big part of doing restoration and trying to restore forest is trying to measure how well we are doing that. So we monitor how the soil recovers from being used for cattle pasture to be in like more resembling more uh, forest, like forest soil. So we take these, sam these samples of soil and we send them to the University of Costa Rica. So I'm just making sure we collected the right amount of soil because this is going to a nice lab and needs to be right perfect and labeled also. So what, I mean, so let, let's talk a little bit more about soil. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, so why why soil? I mean, what does soil tell you about um, what's happening in the system? Why why do you why do you want to know about how planting trees is changing soil? So you, can you show them this soil? Yeah, I can show. Them. So do you, you can see this like loose soil. So this is from a plot where we planted trees many years ago. But when you have cattle living on, on top of that soil for many years, it's compacted. It has lo lost like most of its nutrients. So when you plant trees and wait a few years, then you have all the nice qualities you want in there. Like the right amount of phosphorus and nitrogen, and carbon, and all the nice bacteria you want in the soil. There you go. Soil's underrated, Joe. I, I, I heard a fact actually that we, in, in the last couple of centuries, we've lost about 40% of the world's topsoil. Yeah, we need to think more of soils and what we're doing to them. All right, so there we got it, Joe. We got soil lady. Soil so lady. questions for soil lady. <laughs> and then we're going to go on to these um, couple of young folks here. We've got Ruth Mary, who I think we've uh, we spent some time within a tree before, Joe. And then uh, Marvin, who uh, has spent his whole life here on the peninsula, and he knows lots of the trees. Like, if I don't know something, which is a lot of the time, like when I find a seed, I take it to Marvin, and he's like an encyclopedia about tree species. He's incredible. So what are you guys doing, Ruth? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop you on camera. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, this time we are processing some of our plants from the nursery and some food that we have collected. So we are part of the restoration team at Maria Jose, but uh, our work is more focused on the tree science, their ecology, and the propagation in the nursery. So after that, uh, Maria Jose and the team can make sure to plant them in the appropriate places. Uh, but also, part of our work is to work with rare and threatened tree species. So here I'm going to show you some of them. Last time, last time we were with you, right, there was a, a seed that you were showing us that, like, fell, you know, it was, like, falling out of the sky, the, the gavilan. Oh, the gavilan, yes. Uh, so, for example, here we have this tree called gavilan. So this is one of the, the little trees from last time when we saw the seeds. You guys have now germinated. Yes, we were able to germinate. So we are we're really happy. It's like a new baby for us. <laughs> So the, and this is an endangered species of tree. Yes. Uh, so here, all our trees are endangered. So this one is endangered. Um, here. What What's Marvin doing? Okay. Right. So Marvin is photographing the uh, the fruit of Inga gondolensis. It's another tree species that is endangered from the bean family. Uh, so it's really easy to identify. Marvin can show us how. So they look like, uh, like here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, most of the beans are quite elongate, but this particular species has this uh, big shape. So this distinct, well, yeah. it maybe looks like maybe a, a rugby player or an American football player's <laughs> ears, but not my ears. Yeah, uh, yeah and this is the legal sapling from, from this tree. Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. And what about this one? Tell me about this. This one looks tiny. This looks like it's only just germinated in the last couple of days. Yeah, it's tiny, but it's our, our goal for us. <laughs> so in, in the plant world, um, this is like our living dinosaur. Uh, so there are only uh, six mature individuals now in the world, and there is no... Wait, wait, wait. There's six... Adult trees of this species known in the world. Yes, known in the world, and all, all of them are found here in, in Costa Rica, especially in the south part. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so, how many of these little ones have you got? So, uh, we successfully propagate 50, 50 individuals. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's a good increase in the oh, population. No, the final tree is, is our treasure for us. You no, know, it's incredible. Uh, but we only we don't only collect fruits and propagate them, but we're also trying to know more about the ecology to gather more information. So, for example, who are the seed dispersers of these of these red and threatened trees? Uh, so, for this particular species, for example, we found that the seed dispersers are uh, the, uh, like the olingo, the kinkachu, the opossum, nocturnal uh, species of, of, of mammals. But how did you how did you find that out? Okay, so what we do is, as you know, uh, I like to climb trees. <laughs> so part of the job is to climb the trees and set up camera traps. So we let the camera for a couple of weeks. So this, that's the only way to, how we know like which animals are dispersing the, the seed from these, from these trees. Incredible. This is uh, awesome work uh, to see uh, such precious rare species. So Joe, uh, I think like, I. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious to me why I love living and working in these incredible research stations, because you meet people like these guys uh, who are doing some incredible things. Um, they're, they're passionate. They do it because they love it. And then when you get them together in a station like this, it's like a melting pot of all these incredible things going on. So um I think we should turn it over to some questions and I can like run around and we can go back to any of the groups and we can do some questions. What do you think? I couldn't agree with you more, Andy. Thank you so much for that amazing tour of all the activities, just a hub of activity. It was so great to meet everybody and see all the different projects uh, that you have on the go. So let's get it going. I'm going to go first to, we've got a grade seven class hanging out in Waterloo, Ontario with Miss Orsini. So I'm gonna bring them into the stream. There they are. Hey, grade sevens, how we doing? Hello. All right, we're gonna get a little bit feedback because I know you're joining on a second uh, device, but go ahead with a question if you have one. I was, I was wondering what specific the feedback is so bad. It's okay, after the question, I'll pop you out. Um, the, we were wondering what kind of... I'm going to type in. Okay. All right, we'll let them type. While they're typing their question, I'm gonna jump to another classroom. We're gonna go to Mrs. Coolin's grade nine class joining us. Let me bring them into the call. Um, there they are. How are we doing grade nines? Yeah. Okay. Cassia, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. You can come up if you want to ask. Hold on. We got another question. She's just coming up. All right. We're ready. Yep. Come talk over here. If you need to put your mask down, talk. Yep. Um, nice and loud for it. I feel like so many places. You gotta take your mask off and say a little. Oh. It's okay. How does it feel to be in like so many places? What was that, Joe? So yeah, I, I think she's wondering about how does it she was feel? Asking, how does it feel in so many places? Maybe how does it feel to work in so many places around the rainforest? Ah, okay. How does it feel? Um, that's a tricky one. I mean, it, 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 to be honest, I, I feel pretty pretty privileged that I get to uh, that I get to spend time in like such an incredible ecosystem. I mean. Uh, 
they're such important places on the on the planet and you know uh i just feel very lucky uh, more than anything and uh honored that i get to like spend time in them it's uh, it's a great place it's hard it's tough rainforests are not easy places to live and work like i said it's very hot it's humid there's always insects trying to trying to bite you and eat you and um so it's a challenging environment but it's really uh it's also very exciting because you never know what you're going to see and there's so much biodiversity there's so much life um it it's kind of i would say it's exciting more than anything so you know i grew up in the the northwest of england which is you know it's got its benefits we make great pies but you don't feel like so excited and alive when you're out in the countryside working walking through a field full of sheep uh um, but in a rainforest it's just unpredictable and it's exciting um so yeah that's that's how i kind of feel about it very yeah, cool well our great sevens they sent a question via the chat for us and they're wondering andy can you tell us about a few more uh endangered species that you're working to protect yeah absolutely um so so let me like try and think through the list I mean it's quite surprising um just how many of the trees and trees and plants I think Ruth and Marvin and the the team are great advocates for for the 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 tree side of conservation and there's a lot of rare and threatened trees that we we're, we're working with. Um one of the species I I'd say that um I work a lot with with Eleanor and uh other members actually all around the peninsula so not just with also conservation but other communities or the universities is we do a lot of big camera trap surveys and we do it not just like in a little area with a handful of camera traps we run big surveys with over 200 camera traps and we've got partners from universities here in Costa Rica to the eco lodges to the communities themselves and what we're really interested in is some of those big animals that tell us about the health of an ecosystem So a couple like I'm going to mention three that come to my mind immediately um and then we'll go and see if Eleanor agrees or whether she's got some different ones but what I think uh the spider monkeys which is an endangered species that moves uh, a lot of the trees the rare trees that Ruth is working with and Marvin's working with they move them around the forest so it's not like looking at just animals or just plants all of this stuff is interconnected and spider monkeys are a key species that move trees and seeds around so our rainforest without spider monkeys wouldn't be the same rainforest they would be completely different um another animal is the tapir so uh, tapirs are, are these incredible big like forest cows in peru they call them the sacha vaca which means forest cow and they move seeds uh huge big seeds that small animals can't eat and they move them around the forest and then they poop them out and the the feces helps them to kind of germinate um and that's what Ruth and Marvin actually have to do with some of the seeds not poop them out but they do bathe them in acid so they kind of recreate the gut passage process of some of the animals to get those seeds to germinate and then i think the other animal that's really exciting is an animal called the white lip peccary and they go around in these huge herds absolutely hundreds of them um and they they what we call an ecosystem engineer they basically decide what grows because they eat lots of the fruits and the seeds so they they kind of like provide a balance in the ecosystem they're quite incredible um and then i think if we went and asked the marine team they would have a completely different set of animals and uh would probably tell us about the hammerhead sharks and the uh, the giant manta rays and and the whale sharks and all these different species in the marine environment. All right, let's bring in Mr. Aiken's class. Uh some sixth graders and they have a question for us, Andy. Are there any species that are invasive in the peninsula? Oh, that that's a great question. Um Ruth, yes. we got a question about invasive species. So I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you. There are there are some invasive species. Fortunately, like for the most part, the rainforest um it's quite a competitive dense environment and it's hard for invasive species to kind of get in there. 
but there are some examples of it and um, especially around river edges and forest gaps where there's more opportunity for invasive species but Ruth can maybe tell us about a couple of those. Yeah, for, uh, for example, yeah, here in Costa Rica, we have one uh, invasive species of ginger. It's growing mainly in the high in the, uh, in the Amistad. In the highlands. In the yeah. highlands. Uh, it's getting really, really invasive. Uh, so that's one, one of the reasons why here, for example, we focus in native, native sp species, both trees, but also ornamental plants. So most of the invasive species are bring from other countries with ornamental purposes, like this ginger. The ginger has really beautiful flowers and people love to have them in the gardens. Uh, but here we are also in the rainforest, as you know, we have a high diversity of plants and the idea is to also uh, search for them and give the, the potential to use as an ornamental, ornamental species. And that's what we also do here in our nursery, trying to propagate this uh, this species, wild species from the forest, um, ornamental purposes. So like native ornamental. Native sort of, ornamental yeah. species. Okay, cool. Really great question. Let's bring in another group here. Um, Holland Landing, I can see public school. Looks like your devices might have gotten disconnected. If you're able to turn your camera back on. Ah, there they are. Let me bring them in. Uh, we're wondering how you got from, um, uh, what did you learn in college for this job? That, that's, uh, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. Um, okay, so what did I learn in college that prepared me for this job? You know, um, my, my, my real answer is that you can learn the fundamentals, right? So you can learn the very basics about maybe the theory of like how, how an ecosystem works, um, maybe how a plant respires. So the very basics of biology and maybe some of the theory, right? The past research that's gone on. But honestly, like you can't really understand a rainforest or an ecosystem so complex until you go and spend time in it. You can read about how this bird interacts with the ants there's something about like seeing it that means that you really connect to it in a different way. Um, so I think that you can learn a lot of, about the principles and about what research has happened before, what we know. Um, but for me, like uh, I, I, I learned way more by being here and by being in, in the environment. And then just getting out there and, and, and doing the research, you know, um, so I, when I first went to Ecuador to a tropical rainforest, I'd never done pitfall trapping in my life. You know, I'd read about it in a textbook and then all of a sudden I was digging holes for these big 20 litre buckets in the middle of the forest and, uh, you know, stung by scorpions and bullet ants. And, uh, then you really learn about the system. Um, but yeah, but certainly the fundamentals, the, the, the theory and, and the information, but, uh, yeah, uh, get out there and experience the, the ecosystems. That's that's what I would say. All right, so let's bring in Westfield 7B joining us in this wall. How are we doing, Seven? Good, thanks, Joe. Thanks, uh, Dr. Whitworth. Um, our class is just in the middle of um, our interaction in the ecosystems unit. And we're looking at some of the things that impact ecosystems. And we were wondering what you felt was the biggest threat to the ecosystem in the Osa Peninsula. Okay, that, I mean, fabulous question, and I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to like go go too much about like talking too long about the doom and gloom of things, but you know, the two biggest threats undoubtedly right now that we're facing is, is um, climate change, which we're hearing more and more about. Um, but climate change also works uh, at the same time with something that we call biodiversity loss, um, which is really the, the loss of the, the life from these ecosystems. So the loss of animals, the loss of plants. So every time a species goes extinct, we're not just losing that species, we're losing all of the interactions that that plant has with all of the animal life around it. So 
I think that those are the two biggest problems is the breakdown and the loss of biodiversity and, and then how these ecosystems are going to adapt to a changing climate. And um, I think that's why it's very powerful what the team's doing here with their restoration project. They're focused on native species. They're not just ignoring the rare things and the endemic things. They're incorporating these into the restoration projects so that the, the forests that we regrow are actually very diverse and rich forests and not just dominated by one or two very common species. So I think that working at thinking about the forests of the future and how you can build resilience. Um, one of the biggest challenges all over the world when it's unmanaged uh, is, is hunting. And very quickly in a fragile ecosystem, um, a small number of hunters can actually deplete populations of, of animals. And so I think that's uh, another challenge for us. Um, but a lot of the challenges that OSA faces are actually similar to, to other places that are around the world. Um, but what I love about OSA is that there's a lot of great stuff going on. And we're seeing a lot of animal populations recovering from, from the past two or three decades. We're seeing a lot of good news stories. And I think one of the other things that we need to focus on is keeping people connected to nature. So, you know, as we migrate into the urban environments and the cities, that we, we remember that we're part of this natural ecosystem and that we belong to it. And we, we, we have a role to play uh, in balance with that system. So there's my very uh, quick summary of that. <laughs> oh, I love it, Andy, great points, absolutely. Uh, Peterborough, Ontario, we have the Youth Leadership in Sustainability Group joining us. We're ready for you. Cool. Is it okay if like, I ask it in Spanish? Like, you hear that, Ant? Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Um, quería preguntar con qué universidades están relacionados y a qué universidad fuiste tú para estudiar para esto. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing it. Did you hear it? No, I didn't. Sorry. Try one small. Um, ¿En qué más? ¿Con qué universidades están relacionados? What do you need to study for uh, to work with biodiversity, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, look, I mean, uh, yeah. So, um, so Joe, like, uh, the questions about like, what do you kind of need to study, right, to work in this kind of field um, with biodiversity and. Um, I think, I think there's many routes, really. I mean, my, uh, to some extent, I, I took a pretty typical route. I studied zoology for my undergraduate. I studied conservation biology for my master's. And then my PhD research was in tropical ecology. I lived in, in Peru for six years, working in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and there are, there, there are really many different routes that you can take. Um, I don't think that if you haven't necessarily done a degree in biology, that you can't be involved in conservation or biodiversity. I think more than ever, now is the time that we realize as conservationists that we need to bring different people in to conservation and biodiversity, that we need economists. We need people that understand business and our, our financial mechanisms in society. We need to understand sustainability and uh, we need to understand farming. We need to know uh, about biodiversity from an agricultural background. So I think the routes to get interested in natural ecosystems and biodiversity, I think there are many different ways to do it and we need uh, uh, many different people involved. Um, so I, I think uh, you just have to have the passion and think about how, how all of this links together to help to help people in nature. Yeah, and Andy, I think you'd agree too that you know a degree in science isn't necessarily a prerequisite to be involved in conservation work. And all kinds of skills you can learn uh, on the job, and all kinds of different roles that people can play in different projects. Yeah, I mean, Joe, look at you bringing in people from all over the world into, into a virtual experience like this and given, you know, we've got a great platform now to communicate to people uh, outside of our little research station. Um, 
And so, like you say, it, 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 the, the doors are like wide open for conservation, biodiversity, nature. We need more people coming at this from different angles. And these kooky scientists are just uh, one, <laughs> one role to play in all of that. All right. Well, we can squeeze in another question or two. So I'm going to bring in uh, Mr. Aiken's class again, and they can go ahead with another question. If you can just uh, unmute for me, Mr. Aiken's group. What species of ants ate the flesh off the animals that have died? <laughs> Great question. All right, Eleanor, over to you. <laughs> no, uh, what species of ants uh, eat the flesh off the animals? Well, I'll be honest, I'm not an ant biologist. Um, I wish we had Edward Owen Wilson here right now to answer that question. Yes. Um, but there, there are a bunch of, um, there are so many different species. Um, I, I mean, you, you see, uh, there are these like subterranean kind of army ants that are kind of incredible and they live underground. They almost like never come out above the surface. Um, and you'll often see them like appear like below some kind of rotten fruits or some carcass and they'll just start eating away at it and pull it down. Uh, they'll take off bits of flesh. Um, it's not just the ants, actually, that feed on the carcasses. One of the most important groups that do feed on the carcasses, Eleanor ha does happen to know about, and uh, they're called dung beetles. And uh, dung beetles, believe it or not, don't just feed on poop, but there's a huge uh, proportion of dung beetles that feed on rotten carcasses. Butterflies as well. Flies, there's lots of flies that um, come and feed on carcasses. So there's a whole ecosystem of animals and insects that feed on rotten carcasses. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about dung beetles on rotten carcasses because you know more about that than me. So we have 37 species of dung beetle here in the Ossa, and a few of those feed on rotting meat, rotting fruit, rotting mushrooms, as well as that, lots of different things they can find in the forest. Um, so they're really important. They kind of clean up the forest. What, the do, rainforest cleaners, what do they do? Like, what do the dung beetles do? Like, how do they work? Ah, so when they're feeding on dung, we have three types of dung beetles. No, on the carrion. Ah. On the dead meat. That's what we want to know about. Ah, so they, they, put, it, they put it back into the ground so there's different nutrients that are going back into the ground but they also feed on it as well and they feed it to their larva so the next generation of dung beetles. There you go. One of the there's there's I one think. there's one species of uh, dung beetles Joe, that we don't we don't have it here on the Ossa. Um, I've, I've seen it in the Amazon and when it when it starts to get dark in the evening this giant buzzing sound comes it's quite terrifying and and then this huge thing you might think it's a bat comes flying through the air and it's this huge dung beetle and it's like bl bright metallic blue and they basically feed on dead things and they're uh, and they just like bury like they fight over the meat and then like pull it into the ground for the larvae but uh, they're super cool very very cool well, Andy, uh, I want to start off with a huge shout out to all the groups who tuned in via YouTube today, all the classrooms on Facebook as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sending us some questions. A shout out to all of our camera classes. We had a great group uh, of students joining us live today in middle school and high school. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and then Andy, I mean, I'd love to individually thank everybody. You'll have to go around and do that for me. But thank you to your whole team. Not only are you doing incredible work, but um, what you had to share with us today and, and give us that little taste of, of life at this station was pretty incredible. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Joe. So, you know, uh, I just hope that as many people, when it's safe to do so, can get out and experience uh, a place like this and uh, go and hang out with uh, biologists and scientists and go and experience a rainforest or the deep ocean. You know, I hope everybody gets to do that at some point. All right. Couldn't agree with you more, Andy. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, and we are going to sign off from Costa Rica. Thanks, everyone.